Today, I'm delighted to introduce Oleg Zivinsky, distinguished macroeconomist. As you may know, Oleg is working in many different areas, mostly perhaps uh, his work on public finance and macro, but he's done work in many different things in networks. We're going to see tomorrow uh, more about him on that uh, information, learning, financial markets, environment, and he's going to tell us about past developments and histories. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for. Uh, for being here, and uh, this is joint work with uh, Georgi Ryabov, so he's a mathematician uh, working stochastic analysis at the National Academy of Sciences of uh, Ukraine, so he's actually at Kiev now, so, uh, so it's also nice to, to think of the faults over there while we think about bad determinants and uh, what they have to go through, unfortunately. All right. So, so let's think about path dependency. So on one hand, path dependency is uh, pretty much everywhere. So like all of economics and finance is, uh, is very path dependent. And let me give you just a couple of simple examples. So think about consumption problem in incomplete markets or pretty much any other setting. And your consumption is going to be path dependent. So if your consumption is going to depend on your wealth, maybe a bunch of other things is going to and uh, your wealth is path dependent as well because it depends on your previous income, maybe on whether you hit the, um, the income with market constraints of a sort. But at the same time, many of these models, you can still summarize path dependency in small number of state variables. Okay, so for example, wealth is a typical state variable. We typically just go down and rewrite the problem the cursor using wealth as a state variable. I'll give you something more complicated example. So think about the moral hazard model, where effort is unobservable. So there, and in fact, in any of the moral hazard, limited commitment models, or any other setting like, setting, setting, like, setting like this, what you get is you get path dependency being generic. So your actions in the optimal contract are going to depend on the whole history of your previous, previous actions. And uh, still, even in this you know, rather sophisticated models, what you can do is you can still write the model recursively. So in addition to, say, your wealth, you would need to carry some other variable, for example, promised utility. So in these models, typically, maybe you need to have a third variable, but you still will be able to summarize complicated path dependency in terms of the low, low number of uh, state variables. In fact, if you think about modern microeconomics and modern finance, it's really built on recursive tools. So if you take the classic textbook of Linkus and Sargent, so they say that, in fact, writing recursive representations for his dependence <coughs> is one of the major achievements of the macroeconomic program. In fact, that book is called Recursive Macroeconomic Theory. If you go back to the discussions in the 70s, However, it was a little bit less clear that you could rewrite the models, the macro models recursively. The classic example is time consistency. So Prescott, in his famous uh, time consistency paper, argued that, in fact, the limit programming is not applicable to the models with time consistency. Uh, in fact, hence, there is time consistency. So on the other hand, a large part of the program of macroeconomists was trying to find the personal representations, even for the models which seemingly have difficulty, like the models that uh, Prescott looked at time consistency. And I gave you an example with the promised utility. So the bottom line is, if you think about the state of modern macroeconomics, so the moment you put all kinds of other frictions, heterogeneity, um, moral hazard, limited commitment, you can think about most of the models in macro as dynamic program squared. So you have something like wealth and maybe something like a promised utility that maybe some other things that summarize still the past in a set of low, um, low number of state, uh, state variables. So that's where we stand. What I'm going to be talking about, however, is a different set of scenarios uh, in, about environments in which it may be difficult or impossible to write down the recurs recursive representation. 
Well, alternatively, you just don't like recursive representations. As actually, I don't like recursive representations myself that much. I worked on them quite a lot. Uh, but I will particularly be interested in the environments where there is non-trivial path dependence or hysteresis. That is where the policies that you previously take may generally and non-trivially affect the environment itself. And in fact, the effects of policies are going to be very bad dependent. And in particular, what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop in this, uh, in this talk a very general set of tools that are going to allow you to solve a very general class of pretty much every path dependent problem that you can, you can think of. And I'm going to refer to path dependency as hysteresis, which is dependence of the environment uh, outcomes on the exact sequence of pre previous actions. Let me start, since this is a finance conference, let me start about maybe talking about path dependency in finance and uh, what you can, in general, handle with the kind of tools that, that, that uh, would develop. So heavy persistent, an important part of uh, asset pricing models, typically heavy persistence that people look at is very simple, so some kind of cumulative past uh, de dependence on the past choices, you can do a much more sophisticated set of habit persistence models, where habits depend on say, age, on all kinds of previous things that happened before, etc. You can look at the models of momentum, where momentum is also sophisticated and beyond the typical you know, examples of theoretical momentum that will look at asset price. You can look at capital gains taxes. Capital gains taxes are path dependent, so they depend on when exactly you bought uh, a good, or when you exactly bought a stock, when exactly you're selling. You can look at all kinds of things related to behavioral models, and uh, behavioral literature, which I don't know that well, but people talk about all kinds of things where uh, psychological things and important events matter. Uh, that happened previously in life, and they may generate bad dependency in a much more sophisticated way than the behavioral finance uh, looked at this. Uh, bad dependent options. So one of the important initial questions in just asset pricing in general, so you can look at this kind of thing. More broadly, so these are sort of a kitchen sink of different things where path dependency appears in various parts of macro, and we still don't have that many tools to analyze them. So climate and economy, something I worked on, so there is evidence of how exactly, for example, the Arctic regions are being thawed off. So uh, how global warming affects exactly the thawing of ice. Um, the exact path may matter for how much CO2 is released in the, uh, in the environment. Monetary policy, so hysteresis, the long periods of unemployment may fundamentally change the inflation unemployment trade-off. Adjustment costs. So if you have models of investment uh, where adjustment costs, there is no trivial history, so path dependence that actually generically arises. We talk a little bit about an interesting literature in political economy, where also history arises. But in particular, there's a very nice uh, survey evidence or survey paper by um, I think his name is Scott Page, uh, he's a political scientist, and he distinguishes two types of path dependency. So one he talks about path dependence, and the other one he talks about is fat dependence, P hat dependence. <laughs> so path dependence is when exactly the sequence of event, events matter. So P A T H matters, and the fat or P hat dependence is when just the combination of different things, different things matters. So for example, if you take uh, take a person, so if you first eat Potatoes and then we eat foie gras. Uh, maybe they're different from some teams like, eh, I started eating foie gras early on in my life as a French, right? And then maybe they're different if you first start eating foie gras and then you eat potatoes, even though the cumulative amount of potatoes and foie gras is the same over, over your life. Uh, all kinds of models of increasing returns, you know, the path dependency of exact uh, invention of technologies, like quality, the, the type in. Uh, uh, the type and pattern generate credit returns. My own field of optimal dynamic taxation, actually, that's the reason why I was initially interested in path dependence, because generically what you get there in the dynamic taxation models, you get very 
uh, strong path dependence in terms of how taxes depend on pre previous people actions and so on. All kinds of theoretical applications, as I'm going to skip that. All right. So in particular, what I'm going to be interested in are the environments in which A, there is stochasticity, so there are some shocks, and B, there is path dependence. I'm going to actually give you a very simple example of this environment. I'm going to try to analyze this. And essentially, there are two problems of interest to me and two problems in general, how to analyze this problem, the, how to analyze this setups. The first is that it's actually non-trivial to even derive first order conditions there. So why is that? Is, and the reason is that if you have path dependence, then whatever you do now actually is going to affect you in the future. Okay? So how to think about uh, path dependence in this very general circumstances. And in particular, what we'll see is there's going to be a very important a key object that's going to appear. And this is an expectation of the future effects or the future marginal effects of what I do, what I do today. And that's going to be actually the most difficult object to analyze, which I'm going to make significant progress. And then, hence, it brings me to the second point, which is analyzing first, uh, first order conditions. So the key tool, especially the finance folks that are used to, to this tool of analyzing all kinds of stochastic environments is the ETHOS level, or ETHOS formula. And the issue with the ETHOS formula is that it works only for functions. So it works only for something that depends on, say, today's state. But it doesn't work for functionals. It doesn't work for something that depends on the whole trajectory, say, of the past, of the past events. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to enlarge this analysis to analyze environments where there's path dependency rather than just dependency on, on today. And there are going to be three key tools that I'm going to introduce and develop in this paper. So the very first one is going to be um, perhaps the, on one hand is the easiest, on the other hand is in some sense very fundamental ways how to just write down the first order conditions for environments with path dependence. And uh, here I'm going to introduce, so for a simple example, and then the class of very handy problems with path dependency, which, you can, which allow you to write down the first order conditions very neatly. Then I'm going to introduce two key tools. The first tool actually came purely from finance. So there is this uh, guy, uh, Bruno, Bruno Dupere, does anybody know? who the person is, like local volatility. Anyway, so he works for Bloomberg, but he's like a stochastic analysis guy. He was interested in how to analyze path-dependent uh, path dependent options. And he developed actually this very neat, um, very neat tool, which uh, is called functional italema. And then people in uh, academia, in math, stochastic analysis, pick this up and develop it further, even though probably the analysis of this italema should go back to like, the 80s and the 70s, and some Russian mathematicians who work on them. Okay, let's leave this aside. But uh, I'm going to show you that two tools are going to be important. One is this functional eta lemma, which is the generalization of the eta's lemma to the environment where you already have something which is defined as a functional uh, of the trajectory, something that depends on the whole trajectory and how to use uh, or how to write this in some sense, is equivalent to the normal eta lemma. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to derive a new mathematical result, uh, which we call the new, the total derivative formula, which allows you to deal with the conditional expectations. And allows you to write down the, to give you similar marking gain decomposition of the conditional expectation. What that what is, is basically break it down into the drift and into the volatility. So separate the stochastic and time-dependent part, so similar to what eta lemma is. So what I have is going to be a relatively new, or actually very new, but probably not that well known in, in economics. I think we're actually probably the first people who ever use it in economics, with the exception of uh, you know, one small paper before. And uh, the second one is going to be interesting both for mathematicians and for economists. And in fact, for those of you who are interested in like, stochastic discount factors, it's going to be the tool to to analyze it, to analyze the pre-general. Excuse me? Yeah. Is this what you're doing related to Malayabin derivatives? 
So it's going to be related to modern derivative, uh, but uh, it's uh, not going to be dependent. You'll see some elements of modern derivative. I'll talk about what it is. So what I'm going to be interested specifically, I'm going to be interested in uh, the things which are not necessarily marking games. And the total derivative formula is going to be, like if you know what Clark O'Connor formula is, so it's going to be like time, the, it's going to be extension of Clark O'Connor formula to the things which depend on time. So to a non marking game, if you want. So that's precise answer. But I'm going to talk about modern derivative. Go ahead. So maybe ahead of this, uh, do you also require a new notion of uh, dynamical consistency? No. I mean, no. I mean, actually, I don't even think about this. So, so I, I understand your question, but uh, I'm not. I'm not even going to think about this. I'm just going to say that there is time consistency. I'm not going to worry about uh, the things like this. But, uh, but I'm just going to. So, but the, however, your question is, I think, interesting because path dependency may introduce all kinds of other issues beyond the normal time consistency. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about this because, in some sense, I'm not rewriting things recursively. Right. What I'm going to do is this. So I'm going to try to, I actually spent a lot of time on doing this, I'm going to try to sort of boil down this rather complicated theory to the, the simplest possible example that's going to be very handy, I think. And I'm going to go through the sequence of examples that allow you to, to analyze them you know, properly. So, so let me start with the example where do I have the ah. <laughs> it's like in a in a bad Eastern European cartoon when you only see like the little <laughs> so I'm not gonna do it. So window. Uh, okay, so so let's start uh, the blue thing with all the red stuff, right? So this is a plain vanilla uh, problem. So where you have suppose you have some brown in motion W T. Stochasticity, if you want. And you just have a quadratic clause. So you just want to hit CT, choose their consumption close to WT. Let's forget about negativity, all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, like, I, I can handle all this, but that's not important. So, without the red stuff, it's just a very simple problem where, where I maximize the expectation between zero to some capital T of not being wrong or hitting my consumption as close as possible to my income WT. So as plain vanilla as possible, we can immediately see what the solution of the blue thing is going to be. You just choose CT equal to WT. But then I'm going to add uh, the, the, uh, I'm going to add an additional part, which is HT CT. And what's going to be? It's going to be a functional. So what's a functional? So function takes something, like a number, and maps it into a number. What's a functional? Functional takes a trajectory and maps the trajectory into a number. Okay? So, in fact, the trajectory is going to be denoted by CT, so say your consumption, between time 0 to time t. So, all of the previous consumption, and it's going to be adapted, meaning that it cannot depend on the future. So, at time t, I know my consumption. And I'm going to have this additional effect H that may depend on time, so that's HT, and depend on the, on the whole trajectory. So for those of you who want to have something in the back of your mind, you can think about the following. So think about C as being your choice of exercise, and H is in some sense as your health. Okay, so your health depends on the exact uh, exercise pattern you've had over your lifetime. So it's not about uh, the amount of cumulative exercise. Like if you are an Olympic athlete by age 25 and then you don't do anything, it probably gives you a very different result than if you exercise regularly. Or if you didn't exercise at all and you start exercising late in life, it's going to have a different effect. So your trajectory may differ, and it may depend also on time, right? The exact way how you exercise you know, at 44, at 44 may be different from the exact way you uh, you exercise at, I don't know, John is turning 50, at 50. So maybe you know, a little bit, a little bit different. <laughs> okay, so just keep this in mind, but you know, it can be any other trajectory of the path dependency that, 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 that you may, that you may want. The key is that it's going to depend on the path of actions after time two. All right, so 
The simple setting is yeah, suppose that you don't have this additional path dependency, then I know exactly the optimum. The exact optimum is I just choose my consumption equal to the stoch stochastic realization of the stochastic class to the Brownian group. Okay, so plain vanilla, very simple. So now let, let me warm up us, ourselves a little bit. Suppose now I have this additional effect, but it's only going to depend on the action today. Not on the trajectory, but only on the action today, so it's going to be f of ct. Yes, then it's very simple. So I can just find the first order conditions. Actually, in fact, I can find it realization by realization. And I'm going to have that my consumption is going to be equal to this, the same realization of the Brownian motion wt minus an additional marginal effect, f prime of ct. I exercise a little bit more today. The effect is immediate on me today. That's the marginal effect of the exercise of f prime. Okay? I can just immediately use it as a lemma to write down the evolution process for, uh, for ct. But let me even simplify this for you. So I'm going to have my function f of ct being, being linear in, consum in, in consumption or in action ct. It's going to just depend, say, with multiplicatively on the uncertainty, say g of wt, then multiply by ct. Then it's even simpler. I don't even uh, need to, to do anything more complicated. I can just apply the e to lemma directly and get the closed form solution for the evolution of my action. It's going to be the evolution of the Brownian motion. It's going to be the first order effect g prime, which multiplies the evolution of the Brownian motion, dwt. Then it's going to be the second order correction uh, for because the underlying driving process of Brownian motion, just from the eta lemma. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Follows with me. Everybody remember it as lemma. Epsilon doesn't appear in the. Oh, epsilon! Just forget about epsilon. Well, it appears down below. But yeah, it's a typo. I had an epsilon before, but then to simplify, I took it out because I was interested in also the asymptotic expansion. So okay, we'll forget no, epsilon. Okay. Epsilon equal to one. But good catch. All right. So now, suppose I have path-dependent function. Okay. And. Path dependency actually is going to add uh, complexity. Moreover, it's going to add complexity such that even, my, even if my underlying process, WT, was uh, continuous, the solution may not be continuous. So the simplest case is that suppose I just have this path dependent functional, which is be, be exactly the action I have taken, this additional effect, the action I have taken, but exactly at half time before, half time before. So think about this, I suppose from zero to one is my time, so capital T is one, then the effect disappears after, after half time, after my half life, okay? Then before you'll have this effect, and then you won't have this effect, so it's gonna be this continuous job. So even if you start with a, a continuous process, driving the uncertainty before, the result may be discontinuous. So you're going to have a jump at exactly the, at exactly, exactly the half-life. So that's a simple example of how the result may be very different if I have uh, some path-dependent path -dependent functions. So what I'm going to do now is now I'm going to construct a simple example. I'm going to generalize it to a very general class of the functions before. But I'm going to show you how to analyze path dependency if it takes the following form. So my path dependent function is going to have two effects. So the first effect is going to be the contemporaneous effect. So it's CT. So it's the first term over there. It's still going to be path dependent. It's going to be G of WT. It's going to depend on the whole trajectory up to now. So think about this as today's effect. So uh, a fact of how much I exercise today on my health, dependent on all of the previous you know, realizations of my health or uncertainty. And the second effect is going to be the effect of, I call it past initial, past actions. Just, so the effect of the past actions. So the cumulative effect of the past actions I have taken, and again, this is going to be linear, but the coefficients are going to be nonlinear. 
So the coefficients are going to depend on h t, and they're going to depend on what I have done in the past. Okay, so I think about the effect of the exercise being the immediate effect of the exercise, and the effect of the previous levels of exercise on today. I'm going to show you that in some sense, a lot of functionals look like this. I'm going to you know, generalize them later on. So now I'm going to find the first order conditions here. So the way how to write the first order conditions is actually do something that I started doing a long time in, uh, in the context of uh, dynamic fixation, is to do the variation. So start with some optimal action plan and vary that action plan a little bit. And the action plan is optimal, the whole plan is optimal, is if by varying it, by varying this action plan, I cannot do better. Okay. So you can just do the variation. You know, there are many you know, complicated ways for it. You get all your irritative, but let's not, let's not bother about this. What you get, however, is something actually quite, quite intuitive. You get that uh, the optimal consumption today is wt, which is something that would happen, would happen without bad dependency, and two effects. The first effect is the immediate effect, gt of wt, the effect of exercise today, marginal effect of exercise today and today, and you would get the expectation of the impact of exercise today on all of the, pu all of the possible future you know, health states until the end of your life. So, if you don't like exercise, let's think about foie gras. So you're thinking about eating a little bit more foie gras, and you have two effects. You know, foie gras is going to give you a little bit of the effect today immediately, which may depend on your previous pattern. Maybe it's the first time you try foie gras and you think it's terrible. Plus, it's going to have the effect on all of, the, all of the possible future ways for you to enjoy foie gras. If you overeat foie gras today, maybe you'll never gonna like foie gras in the future, right? Or maybe you're gonna get addicted to it. But you don't know what your state of the world is gonna be tomorrow, so you have to, um, you have to evaluate this with the conditional expectation or the effect of having a little bit more foie gras today on all of the possible states in the future. So this is like a stochastic discount factor, really. On the right-hand side, the value function, if you want, that we see everywhere in, in macroeconomics. So the first one is the immediate effect. The second one is the effect of a little bit more foie gras today on all possible states in the world in the future. And uh, uh, there are a little bit of precedence of people deriving these first order conditions with the last general setting. In, in finance, Barvishka, Hansen, and Shane have been doing a bunch of the stuff on the, on the shock elasticity or impulse response, and they're directly related, actually, to, to what we do here in simple sentence. Okay, so this is the first order condition. So the first sort of bottom line of, uh, of what I want to do is the way to derive the first order conditions, even in this very general sentence, is by, by doing this simple variational, variational method. And it gives you sort of the right intuitive way how to think about the effects of bad dependence. All right. So what's going to be the difficulty? So the difficulty now is that, okay, fine, I found the first order condition. It's kind of interesting. But now I want to analyze this. But both of these terms, the, both the immediate effect and the conditional future effect, they're both bad dependent. So what I'm going to show you now is how to write down the single martingale decomposition of that. How to write down essentially the drift volatility decomposition for both of these effects, despite having bad dependence. Could, could you go back one slide? Sorry. What, is that CT or ZT? It's uh, so okay. So start with some process CT. So yeah. How much foie gras yeah, yeah. is optimal? And consider a variation of small amount ZT or foie gras. But ZT is the expression you wrote, or this is the CT is the optimal. So, so that's the, the optimal. optimal. The optimal CT is optimal if any variation ZT cannot improve. 
So think about maximization of function of one variable. So well, sorry, you've written the actual optimum CT? CT is this, yes. And that's the optimum? That's the optimum. I see, okay, and you prove it by... And you prove it by a variation. So think about, the way you think about this is just think about, uh, I mean, how do we usually, in all of the economics, how would you write down the first of our condition? Take F prime of X equal to zero, right? But I'm saying don't do this. It's, uh, it's pernicious. Instead, instead of doing this, do F of X plus a little epsilon times Z and do the Taylor expansion of this. To the first order, you're optimal if this variation cannot improve. But Z improve. can be anything. You don't say what Z is. Z is, is adopted. I mean, it only is history. It depends on the past, but not in the future. You have to check every possible adaptive Check Z. every possible adaptive Z. Okay. Oleg, so could you, in discrete time, very easily up to here, I think? You can do... There's a very simple tree. You have yeah, you can do histories. Do two period. Do two period. So the, the simplest monthly period discrete time is two. Right? It's yeah. today and tomorrow. So in period two, it's going to be trivial because you know everything. Period one, suppose it's just like one the realization, and there's some uncertainty tomorrow. So it's my question. What, so the continuous time is going to show up? Continuous time, time, continuous time doesn't matter here whatsoever. Continuous time is going to just make uh, uh, things a little bit easier because we can use an equivalent of Italian. So what's the beauty of continuous time? Well, the continuous time, what it says is that if I look at so forget about all this bad dependency. Let's think about literally the Italian. Italian is just the Taylor expansion. And the Taylor expansion says that this additional correction that coming from irregularity of the Brownian motion is of the order dt. So that's the only thing that uh, the uh, that continuous time gives you. Otherwise, you could just rewrite everything this with discrete derivative. It's going to be a little clunky. It's like as if uh, it's like as if I don't have calculus. In, in a simple case. So, so I have to check it for any z, but because it's any z, it's actually kind of easy to check. So for something to be true for any z, you need to have that something equal to zero. That's what actually allows to do this. I mean, there's a little bit of the, like, you know, you need to know how to change an order of integration, but, you know, it's pretty straightforward how to do this. Once you, at least for a simple example, for the more complicated things, I'm going to show you a little bit more complicated. What was taking a derivative pernicious? Wouldn't I get the same thing if I had done that? What you uh, but it's not clear what the derivative is in general in general settings, right? So the derivative is obvious if you have a function. But uh, what's a derivative of a function? You can think about this as of partial derivatives, right? And in fact, all of the action here is going to be about trying to use different notions of derivatives to sort of write these things nicely. And I can, so that's sort of the first part of the answer. The second part of the answer is that I can write down the models in which the first order condition is going to be very, very complicated, while the variation like this of something known is going to be, is going to be simple, simpler. This is the Gato derivative. This is the Gato derivative. So the Gato derivative in the winner space. Oh, but it doesn't have to be winner space, actually. Yeah. So it can be much better. Yeah. Alright, so now I have two parts, right? So I have the, the first part which is path dependent, the second part which is path dependent. And I still will be able to write it down for you as the drift volatility decomposition, the same marking value decomposition. And that's going to be actually the whole name of the game for this week. Alright, so, so we'll have these two things, right? One is the, the present effects, which is already written down as a function of G of the trajectory. It's a given function of G of the trajectory. And to write down the drift volatility decomposition, same marking value decomposition for this, I'm going to introduce uh, the DBS formula or the functional eta formula for the non anticipative functions. So for the functionals that depend on the trajectory. The second part is going to be very tricky. So the first part is new and interesting because it's a very powerful formula, very cool formula. The second thing is going to be super tricky because that thing, the conditional expectation, is actually very difficult to write as a function of the past. So it's a, it's some object. I know it's a function of the past, but I don't know what it is. I'm going to show you how to write down the 
semi marking algae composition of those of those objects. Okay. And that's going to be actually the really new theoretical mathematical stuff. Yeah. All right. So let's start with the first one with uh, the Dupuis formula. And uh, what I'm going to do is it's going to be a little plan of what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce two notions of derivatives for Alexis or Lyse derivatives. And the two notions of derivatives, which are uh, which are going to be in some sense you know, natural. And I'm going to show you how with this notion of derivative, what you get is you get essentially the Eta's formula. Okay. So, so that's the first. That's it's all due, due to Dupuis. So the whole grain goes here. OK, so how does the functional work? So, so I have a trajectory, and I have something that takes the trajectory and maps to a number. How exactly you exercise over a lifetime maps to your health. So the first derivative is going to be a vertical derivative. The vertical derivative says, I'm going to look at the path of my exercise, and I'm going to today bump up my exercise. So think about it as the new year resolution, right? Like you did like zero for most of the year, and on January 1st, you're all like, <laughs> I need to do this vertical derivative thing. So I need to just discontinuously bump up, OK? And then you look at the effect on your health, including the health on January 1st from this exercise. Typically, if you're a little sore, so it may actually be positive or negative, but whatever, OK? That's the vertical derivative. If you did not have the functional of the path, but just the function of the path, it's the same as the, just the usual space derivative, right? So you look at the effect of, you know, suppose your health is how much you exercise today. You bump up your exercise, you get the effect of the exercise, okay? Here is going to be the change in the whole functional from this discrete, discrete jump on the x side. Like if you did nothing, right, and then you bought a rowing machine like me and Richard and, like, you know, started rowing hard on January 1st, it's going to be, you know, a bad effect. Okay, so that's a vertical derivative. In the concept of when they have just a function, it reduces to the normal space derivative. Okay. This is the formal definition of it. What's a horizontal derivative? Horizontal derivative basically is the following. So I go on, I come to January 1st, like I look back, I'm like, I exercised pretty well during the last year. I'm going to just continue exactly the same thing I've done on, on December 31st. I'm not going to buy the trolling machine. I'm going to still you know, run on my treadmill for the next day. Okay? And that's a horizontal derivative. If, again, I did not have a functional of the path, so something that maps the whole trajectory, it would be just exactly like a time derivative, how my health changes with the passage of time. So this is a sort of natural concept that we're used to the concepts of normal derivatives under the... Uh, what happened to the rest of the path? It's in the future, because I want to look at the adapted stuff, right? But, but you've changed it from t to t plus epsilon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to look at the effect of that. When I evaluate my function at t plus, uh, t plus epsilon, mm -hmm. I'm going to look at the effect of this. I'm going to look on January 1st, at the end of January 1st, after I exit exactly the same thing on December 31st, I'm going to look and assess, how do I feel? Without any worry about the future. Without, you know, I'm going to, yeah. And I'm going to look at it because all of my effects, I'm going to, they're going to be future as well, but until now, I'm just going to look at the, at this function that maps my health into the past exercise. I mean, obviously, I'm going to choose the optimal stuff. I'm going to look at what's going to happen in the future. But now I just want to look at the mechanical effect of changing my exercise on my health without asking whether it's optimal or somewhat. And without asking how that, effect, that change affects the And future. then when I choose the, how much I should exercise, what should I do, I'm going to look at you know, what happens with this derivative. So I'm going to plug it into the first order condition. Okay. All right, so this is just the finish of the first law derivative. So, Dupuret derived this uh, very neat form on quantum Fourier and as a probability, and just generalized it, like, predefined it, etc. And what it says is that even if I have a functional, not a function, of the past or of the path, I have an equivalent of the eta formula 
if instead of the usual derivatives, I have this two new concept of derivatives. Let me do again the suspense. <laughs> so this is going to be like the time derivative, like which is my horizontal derivative. And it's going to be dt, right? This time pass changes. This is going to be the second vertical derivative. And it's going to also have the effect dt, kind of like in the Eta's demo, but before it was just a second derivative here. And I'm going to have the first vertical derivative, which is going to have a fact dxt, uh, which is the, the, um, the volatility effect. OK? So now what I have is I have my gt of wt, the current effect, the effect of exercise on today. It's already written down as the functional of the path. So I'm going to directly apply the functional Eta formula and get drift diffusion decomposition. So this is pretty awesome. So like you should, I highly recommend to a bunch of people to look at this because this is just a super powerful formula to do it. It's actually not really applicable to a variety of econ things because we typically get something that comes out of the expectations and that's going to be the second part. It comes out of optimization is going to be the second part. But at least we have dealt with the first part. That's just basically the same thing as the standard data formula but with this new concept of, of derivatives and we get exactly the drift volatility. The interesting thing is this, and it's present in both terms. Even if there are no contemporaneous effects, the effects of the past may matter dramatically. And that's the whole point why the path dependency may be very, very different, because the past effects may be, may be important. But this is just sort of a sign. All right, now the most challenging part of the paper, and that's where sort of the mathematical contribution also is for what we do. Is, is that we have this thing, which is the expectation of the future effects conditional on the filtration of the information I know up to now, Ft. And uh, this is this integral, but let me just call it psi t. So you can look at this and you can say, hey, it's a Martin, right? But it's not, right? Because this psi t is a process itself. So let me just suppose that all of the effects are just one. Then it's just going to be the rest of my life, t minus t. So it's not a martingale, it changes with time. So generically, this whole thing is looks like something like expectation of some process psi t conditional on filtration today. And this is everything we basically ever see in macro and finance looks like this. So this is stochastic discount factor, Euler equation, you know, has this form. So what I again do the suspense. So this is the thing. So this is the key object I want to understand. It's not a martingale. If it were a martingale, go ahead. I'm just going to ask, do you have to restrict how k moves with time? You have to restrict how k moves, how k moves with time and be precise about this. It should be differential. It has to be time differential. It has to be time differential. You can enlarge the significant. Sorry? You can enlarge this significantly as well. For this simple example, I'm just going to assume that k is differential with respect to time. I see, that makes sense. Okay, but because what you need to do is you need to have some order in how things change with time. Like if until age 44, my, my uh, past exercise translate one to one to, uh, to my health, but all of a sudden 44, it completely broke down. Like you know, a little bit more exercise just makes me like, you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger or whoever is like the super fit guy. So then these things you know, will have to be accounted for. But you also can't have like a Brownian component to can't. You can actually you have can. like this. Yeah. So what you need to do, and I, I, I can go over this, yes, go this online. So this is like super general. So in fact, what I need to do is I need to just find something which has this absolute continuous component, but gives you the same conditional expectation. Mm -hmm. okay? And there are many things like this. So it's actually you know, very, very easy to do. And in fact, the Brownian actually component surface is nice because it doesn't change with that. I mean, it changes with respect to anyway. So it's easy to deal with it. But it's a good question. All right, so now I'm going to introduce Malarian derivatives. So it's going to be the third part of the derivatives I want to introduce. And what's a Malarian derivative? Malarian derivative is basically, so I have the whole path, and I'm going to bump it up or down. For those of you who have ever done any moral, moral habit models, just think about Malarian derivative as the effect of changing the drift of the Brownian motion every time before that. 
And so I think about this, like I look at my life and I say, what, what would have my life be if at every period before I have exercised a little bit more, regardless of the whatever it was, stochastic shock. Like rain or shine, I exercise.